I would like to welcome everybody to this week's Hebraic Heritage Ministries Yeshiva Discipleship Class. We are studying the biblical festivals. We're currently doing a series of teachings on Passover. This week, we are going to be studying the spiritual application of Passover. Once again, to remind us that when we are studying the biblical festivals, when we are studying the things that happen to the patriarchs, when we're studying the historical events in the scriptures, we need to understand these four important principles in doing so. Number one is that the Bible contains historical information. We're currently studying about the Egyptian redemption, so it also is something that has happened in the past. It is historic. But at the same time, the biblical principle is the events that happen historically are prophecies of what will happen to future generations. These things are written in the scripture for two primary purposes. Number one, to teach us about the redemptive work of Yeshua the Messiah. Secondly, to teach us about our personal redemption in Yeshua the Messiah. Passover, the Hebrew word is Pesach, is called the Festival of Freedom. Realizing that Passover is the Festival of Freedom, it is a deliverance from Egyptian bondage. This is a picture of our deliverance from spiritual bondage. What happened historically with the Egyptian redemption is a spiritual picture for us as believers in the Messiah of how we are redeemed from spiritual bondage unto the deliverance of the God of Israel through Yeshua the Messiah. How is it that we get into bondage? Bondage comes about through sin, but what is sin? In 1 John chapter 3, verse 4, it says, Whosoever commits sin transgresses the Torah, for sin is the transgression of the Torah. You never sin unless you transgress the Torah. If you don't sin, that means you have to do the opposite of what transgressing the Torah means you need to obey the Torah. In John chapter 8, verse 34, Yeshua said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, whosoever commits sin transgresses the law. Whoever transgresses the law is a servant of transgressing the law, is a servant of sin. By not following Torah, that is what gets us into bondage. Now, Egypt is a place of bondage. In Exodus or Shemot chapter 2, verses 23 and 24, and then Exodus chapter 6, verse 5, it is written, it came to pass in process of time that the king of Egypt died and the children of Israel sighed by reason of the bondage and they cry, and their cry came up unto God by reason of the bondage. And God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Yitzhak, and with Yaakov. And I have also heard the groaning of the children of Israel, whom the Egyptians keep in bondage, and I have remembered my covenant. Egypt is a type of the world and the world's System. In Isaiah chapter 30, verses 1 through 3, it is written, Woe to the rebellious children, says the Lord, that takes counsel, but not of me, and that cover with a covering, but not of my spirit, that they may add sin, transgressing the Torah, to sin, that walk, walk the way they live their lives, they go down, 
see when you live after the ways of the world, you are descending. You are going down into Egypt and have not asked at my mouth when you live according to the world and the world system. You are not following and inquiring after the God of Israel. To strengthen themselves in the strength of Pharaoh, trusting in the world, the world system, the world's ways, and to trust in the shadow of Egypt. Therefore shall the strength of Pharaoh be your shame, and the trust in the shadow of Egypt your confusion. The ultimate end result when we trust in the world and the world system is it's got to cause our fall. It's got to result in our lives being confused. What does Babylon mean? It means the land of confusion. Continuing on with the thought that Egypt is a type of the world system, it says in Isaiah chapter 31, verses 1 and 3, Woe to them that go down to Egypt for help and to stay on horses and trust in chariots because they are many and in horsemen because they are very strong. But they look not unto the Holy One of Israel, neither seek the Lord. Now the Egyptians are men and not God and their horses, flesh, and not spirit. Trusting in Pharaoh represents serving the gods of this world. Isaiah chapter 36, verse 6 says, Lo, thou trust in the staff of this broken reed on Egypt, whereon if a man leans, it will go into his hand and pierce it. So is Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to all them that trust in him. Jeremiah chapter 46 verse 25 says, The Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, says, Behold, I will punish the multitude of No and Pharaoh and Egypt with their gods and their kings, even Pharaoh, all them that trust in him. All those that put their trust in the world and the world system ultimately will be brought down and will be punished by the God of Israel. Yeshua is the lamb of the God of Israel who takes away the sins of the world. John chapter 1 verse 29 it says regarding Yeshua, behold the lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Yeshua is our Passover lamb. 1 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 7 says Purge out therefore the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, as you are unleavened. For even Yeshua, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Yeshua is called the Passover lamb of the God of Israel. Historically, the blood of that lamb was to be put on the doorpost. Exodus chapter 12 verse 13. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. There is going to be a judgment upon this world. And if you don't have the blood of the lamb on your doorpost, you are going to face the judgment that comes upon this world. The believers in the Messiah are his house. In Hebrews chapter 3, verse 6, and in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5, it says, But Messiah, as a son over his own house, whose house are we, if we hold fast the confidence in the rejoicing of the hope, firm unto the end? 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5, You also are lively stones and built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifice acceptable to God by Yeshua HaMashiach. The doorpost where we are to apply the blood represents a circumcised heart. Deuteronomy chapter 10 verse 12 and verse 16 says, And now Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you? but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all of his ways, and to love him, and to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Deuteronomy chapter 10 verse 16 says, Circumcise therefore the foreskin of your heart, 
circumcise your heart and be no more stiff-necked. Philippians chapter 3 verse 3 says, For we are the circumcision which worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Yeshua HaMashiach and have no confidence in the flesh. The blood of Yeshua redeems us from sin. In Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3 and verse 7 it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Yeshua HaMashiach who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Mashiach, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Then in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 and 19, it says, For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, but you were redeemed with the precious blood of Yeshua, as a lamb without blemish and without spot. Now let us look at the biblical pattern of how we get into bondage and then how deliverance comes. Number one, the people of the God of Israel quit following the Torah and teaching Torah to their children. As a result of that, number two, the people of the God of Israel will go into spiritual bondage. As a result of going into spiritual bondage, number three, the people of the God of Israel will cry unto Yahweh because of their bondage. And when they do, number four, the God of Israel will send a deliverer to redeem his people from spiritual bondage. Now let's look at step number one, which is quit following Torah and keeping the commandments of the God of Israel. This is our first step into spiritual bondage. Isaiah chapter 42, verses 22 and 24 says, But this is a people robbed and spoiled. They are all of them snared in holes, and they are hid in a prison house. Now, how do you get in that prison house? Isaiah 42, verse 24. Who gave Jacob for a spoil and Israel to the robbers? Did not the Lord, he against whom we have sinned, For they would not walk in his ways. Notice what not walking in his ways is. Neither were they obedient unto his Torah. Because Jacob would not follow the Torah of the God of Israel, that means they sinned. They broke the covenant. As a result of breaking the covenant, it is said of them that the God of Israel is going to sentence them to a prison house, which is bondage or exile. We get into spiritual bondage through the cares of this world. In Mark chapter 4, verse 14, and then verses 18 and 19, it is written, The sower sows the word, and these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word, and the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches, and the lusts of other things, things other than the word of the God of Israel, enter in and choke that word, and the word of the God of Israel thus becomes unfruitful. We are commanded to teach our children the Torah of the God of Israel. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 7, it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. Yeshua said that's the greatest commandment. But let's see how we love the Lord our God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, and with all of our might. This is how we do it. And these words which I command you this day. What words that were commanded that day? The words that were commanded at Mount Sinai. They shall be in your heart and you shall teach them. The commandments given at Mount Sinai. You shall teach them diligently to your children. And you will talk to them when you sit in your house. When you walk by the way. When you lie down. And when you rise up. That means you talk about following the ways of God of Israel and keeping his commandments perpetually from the time you get up to the time you go to bed. And so we are commanded to teach our children the Torah. We can also see this in Psalm 78, verse 5. For he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a Torah in Israel, which he commanded our fathers that they should make them known to their children. Isaiah chapter 54, verse 13 
says what will happen as a result of teaching Torah to our children. And all your children shall be taught of the Lord. What is being taught of the Lord following Torah? And great shall be the shalom of your children. Great shall be the shalom of your children when they are taught of the Lord or when they follow Torah. Therefore, not teaching our children Torah will cause that spiritual bondage. If the blessing of shalom comes by teaching them Torah, spiritual bondage comes if we don't. Isaiah chapter 30 verse 9 says that this is a rebellious people, lying children, children that will not hear the Torah of the Lord. Hosea chapter 4 verse 6 says, My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. What is a lack of knowledge? Because you've rejected knowledge, I will reject you, and you will not be a priest to me. Seeing that you have forgotten the Torah of your God, I will forget your children. The commandment was to teach the Torah to your children, so if you don't, they're going to be lost. The God of Israel will forget your children. He's actually not forgetting. It's that you are not teaching them, which causes them to have a lack of knowledge and a lack of understanding. And so they will be wondering after the ways of the world. That's step number one. Step number two is as a result of not obeying the Torah of the God of Israel and teaching these things to our children, we will then go into spiritual bondage. In Exodus chapter 1, verse 13, it says, And the Egyptians made the children of Israel to serve with rigor, and they made their lives bitter with hard bondage in mortar and in brick and all the manner of the service in the field. All their service wherein they made them serve was with rigor. Deuteronomy chapter 26, verse 6, And the Egyptians evil entreated us and afflicted us and laid upon us hard bondage. Judges chapter 2, verse 11 and 13, and then continuing on in verse 14 says, And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and they served Balaam. And they forsook the Lord and served Baal and Ashtoreth. What is the result of serving Baal and Ashtoreth? And the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and he delivered them into the hands of spoilers that spoiled them, and he sold them into the hands of their enemies round about, so that they could no longer stand before their enemies. Because his people wouldn't follow Torah, the God of Israel allowed them to be taken into captivity by their enemies. And notice, as long as you don't follow Torah, the enemies of the God of Israel and the enemies of his people have the power to be victorious over the people of the God of Israel. Step number three, as a result of this bondage and not being able to defeat our enemies, we will cry out unto Yahweh because of our spiritual bondage. This is what happens to the children of Israel. Exodus chapter 2, verse 23. And it came to pass in the process of time that the king of Egypt died, and the children of Israel sighed by reason of the bondage. And they cried, and their cry came up unto God by reason of the bondage. And we can also see this in Judges chapter 10, verse 10. And the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, saying, we have sinned against you both because we have forsaken our God and we have also served Balaam. As a result of the people of the God of Israel crying out unto him and repenting of their sins when things get too hard for them in the land of their enemies, the God of Israel will have mercy and compassion upon his people and will then send a deliverer to redeem his people. We can see this in Exodus chapter 3, verses 9 and 10. Now therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel is come unto me, and I have also seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppress them. Come now, therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that you may bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Judges chapter 3, verse 9 says, and when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer to the children of Israel who delivered them. And in this case, it was Othniel, the son of Kenaz, 
Caleb's younger brother. We also see this in Judges chapter 3, verse 15. But when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, the Lord raised them up a deliverer, and in this case it was Ehud, the son of Gerah, a Benjamite. So we can see this pattern. Now let's examine in greater detail what is said regarding the historical Egyptian Passover. In Exodus chapter 12, verses 3 through 6, it says these words, Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats. And you shall keep it up until the 14th day of the same month. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. The blood of the lamb was put on the doorpost, Exodus chapter 12, verse 7. And they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper doorpost of the houses wherein they shall eat it. The lamb was to be eaten with unleavened bread and with bitter herbs, Exodus chapter 12, verses 8 and 9. And they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire and unleavened bread, and with bitter herbs. They shall eat it. Eat not at rod, nor sodden at all with water, but roast with fire, his head with his legs, and with the pertinence thereof. The lamb was to be eaten with the staff in your hand. And thus you shall eat it with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. In Exodus chapter 12, verse 13, once again, the blood of the lamb was put on the doorpost. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon your houses, wherein you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. The Hebrew word for Passover is Pesach. And Pesach means to pass or to hover over. And there's two spiritual meanings of Pesach, passing or hovering over, as it relates to Yeshua the Messiah and our personal relationship with him. Number one, it represents passing over from death and sin, that's Egypt, to salvation, that is redemption in Yeshua the Messiah. Number two, it represents allowing by faith the blood of Yeshua to hover over our lives and to give us divine protection from the enemy. Passover is the beginning of months. Exodus chapter 12, verse 2. This month shall be unto you the beginning of of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Even as Passover is the beginning of months, repenting of our sins, which is leaving Egypt, and putting the blood of Yeshua upon our heart is the first step in our salvation in Messiah. Accepting Yeshua as Messiah is the beginning of of our redeemed walk. Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 4 says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin? What is sin? Transgressing the Torah. When we sin, we're in bondage. And so when we're sin, we're in Egypt. Shall we remain in Egypt that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin? If we're dead to sin, that means we leave Egypt. And how would we leave Egypt? With a staff in our hand. We're to do it quickly. How shall we live any longer then? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Yeshua HaMashiach was baptized into his death? How were we baptized into his death? We do it when we put the blood of the Lamb, his blood, upon our doorpost or upon our hearts. 
Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Messiah was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. And how do we walk? Walk is how we live our lives. What is the newness of life? Not serving sin, not following the ways of the world and the world system. What's the opposite of that? Being servants of the God of Israel. And what did the God of Israel say? When I redeem you from Egypt, you will serve me on this mountain. Where is the mountain? The mountain is keeping his commandments. So we're servants of the God of Israel with the purpose of keeping his commandments. And Yeshua said in John chapter 14, verse 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. We need to understand that even as Passover is the beginning months, Accepting Yeshua as the Messiah is the beginning of our walk. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 says, Therefore, if any man be a Messiah, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. That means you've left Egypt. Behold, all things are become new. That's because you put the blood of the Lamb upon the doorpost. You accepted Yeshua as the Messiah. The Lamb was to be hidden for four days. In Exodus chapter 12, verse 3 and verse 6, it says, Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb, and you shall keep it unto the fourteenth day of the same month. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. So the lamb was to be kept for four days. Who is the lamb of the God of Israel that takes away the sins of the world? It is Yeshua. So this is a picture of him that he was hidden for four days. He didn't come to the earth to reveal the Father in the manner that he did until 4,000 years following the creation of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. How is this so? That is because each day in creation represents 1,000 years of time. How do we understand that? Because it says in Psalm chapter 90 and verse 4, For a thousand years in thy sight are but as yesterday when it is past, and as a watch in the night. A thousand years is compared to yesterday. Yesterday is a day. Second Peter chapter 3 verse 8 says, But beloved... Be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. Each day in creation represented a thousand years of time. Yeshua then came 4,000 years after the creation of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Now, you remember with that in mind, that's how we can understand in Acts chapter 2. This is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel in the last days. Now, wait a second. That event that happened in Acts chapter 2 happened 2,000 years ago. How can that be called the last days? That's because there's seven days to time. And that event happened after the fourth day. And after you've made it to the fourth day, you are in the end of days. There's only three more days to go. So that event happened in the last days. Yeshua was examined four days to see if there was any blemishes in him, just like that lamb. In Matthew chapter 21, verse 1, and then verses 9 through 11, it says, And when they drew nigh unto Jerusalem, and were come to Bethpage, under the Mount of Olives, then sent Yeshua to disciples. And the multitudes that went before and that followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he that comes in the name of Yahweh. Hosanna in the highest. And when he was coming to Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? And the multitude said, This is Yeshua, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. Following this, what Yeshua does in Matthew chapter 21, verses 12 and 13 and verse 17, Yeshua went into the temple of the God of Israel and he cast out all of them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves. What's he doing? 
He's removing leaven from the house of the God of Israel. Exactly what was commanded at Passover season, to get the leaven out of your houses. So he's going into the house of the God of Israel, the temple, and he's seeing leaven in that house, and he's getting rid of it. And Yeshua said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. I want you to notice what Yeshua calls the temple. He calls it his house. He goes in the temple and says, my house. What does traditional Christianity say about the temple? Well, it was destroyed and did away with, and it's not even necessary anymore. It serves no purpose. But Yeshua calls something that Christianity says doesn't serve any purpose. He calls it his house. I'd like to submit to you it really is his house, and he will rebuild that temple in three days. And we are at the beginning of the third day. Yeshua then left and went out of the city into Bethany, and he lodged there. Now in the morning, as he returned in the city, he hungered. And when he was come into the temple, the chief priests and the elders and the people came unto him as he was teaching and said, By what authority do you do these things? And who gave you this authority? What are they doing? They're questioning and they're examining the Lamb of the God of Israel. And they're saying, now let me see if there's any spot in you. Who gave you the authority to do what you're doing? Then went the Pharisees and took counsel how they might entangle him in his talk. They're trying to find a blemish in him. Tell us, therefore, this is how they're trying to find a blemish. What do you think? Is it lawful to give tribute to Caesar or not? So Yeshua answers, but that same day in Matthew chapter 22... In verses 23 through 28, it is written, That same day came to him now the Sadducees, which say there is no resurrection. Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection of the dead. So those that don't believe in the resurrection of the dead are coming to Yeshua, and guess what they're going to ask him a question about? The resurrection of the dead. What hypocrites. They don't even believe in the resurrection of the dead, and they're trying to ask him a question about the resurrection of the dead saying, Master, Moses said, if a man dies having no children, his brother shall marry his wife and raise up seed unto his brother. What is this referring to? The leveret marriage. Now there were with us seven brethren, and the first, when he had married a wife, deceased, and having no issue, left his wife unto his brother. In other words, they're following the Torah commandments of a leveret marriage. Likewise, the second and the third and even the seventh. And last of all, the woman died also. Therefore, in the resurrection, whose wife shall she be of the seven? For they all had her, or they all were married to her. So the Pharisees questioned him. The Sadducees questioned him. And now in Matthew 22, verses 34 to 36, there is more questioning and examination of Yeshua. But when the Pharisees had heard that he had put the Sadducees to silence, They were gathered together. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, which means he was a student of the Torah, asked him a question, tempted him, saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the Torah? So they're examining him on every little issue to see if there's any blemish in his doctrine. It continues on then, following this incident, that Yeshua then gets examined by Pilate. When the morning was come, all the chief priests and the elders of the people took counsel against Yeshua to put him to death. And when they had bound him, they led him away and delivered him to Pontius Pilate, the governor. And Yeshua stood before the governor, and the governor asked, Are you the king of the Jews? Now, what really is he being asked? What does it mean to be king of the Jews? Well, what is the expectation? That the Messiah is going to come and he's going to set up the kingdom of the God of Israel on the earth, the Messianic kingdom. So Pilate is asking, are you the Messiah that has got to come to set up this Messianic kingdom? Yeshua said, that's what you say. In other words, he said, yes, that's true. When he was accused of the chief priest and the elders, now the chief priest and the elders are still examining him, He answered them nothing. Pilate then finds that Yeshua is without blemish. In Matthew chapter 27 and verse 24 it says, 
when Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but that rather a tumult was made, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. See ye to it. He examined him and couldn't find any blemish in him. Now Yeshua is examined by Herod. Then said Pilate to the chief priests and the people, I find no fault in him. This is Luke chapter 23, verse 4. Now continuing on in Luke chapter 23, I'm reading from verses 7, 9, and 11. And as soon as he knew that he belonged unto Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who himself also was at Jerusalem at that time. Then he questioned with him in many words, but he answered him nothing. And Herod, with his men of war, set him at naught and mocked him and arrayed him in a gorgeous robe and sent him again to Pilate. Yeshua is examined by Annas, the high priest. It says in Luke chapter 3, verse 2, Annas and Caiaphas were both high priests. And at that time, the word of the God of Israel came to John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. Now we are in John chapter 18, verses 12 and 13, and verse 24 it says, Then the band and the captain and officers of the Jews took Yeshua and bound him, and led him away to Annas first, for he was the father-in-law to Caiaphas, which was the high priest that same year. You see, the office of the high priest was bought and sold. It was a corrupted office in the days of the Romans. Now, Annas had sent him bound unto Caiaphas, the high priest. In John chapter 18, verse 14, and then verses 19 and 20 and verse 28, it is written, Now Caiaphas was he which gave counsel to the Jews that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. The high priest then asked Yeshua of his disciples and of his doctrine. Yeshua answered him, I spoke openly to the world. I even taught in the synagogue and in the temple, whither the Jews always resort. And in secret have I said nothing. In other words, you know what I've taught. I've been around here. I've been in the temple. Then led they Yeshua from Caiaphas unto the hall of judgment. He's still being examined. He's going to the hall of judgment. And it was early. And they themselves went not into the judgment hall, lest they should be defiled, but that they might eat the Passover. Yeshua was examined by Judas. In Matthew chapter 27, verses 3 and 4, Then Judas, which had betrayed him, when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself, and brought again the thirty pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned in that I have betrayed innocent blood. Judas recognized that Yeshua was without blemish. And they said, hey, what's that to us? See thou to that. Yeshua was examined by the centurion. In Matthew chapter 27, verse 54, Now when the centurion and they that were with him watching Yeshua saw the earthquake and those things that were done, they feared greatly, saying, Truly, this was the Son of the God of Israel. Yeshua is examined by the repentant thief who died with him on the tree. Luke chapter 23 Verses 39 through 43 says, And one of the thieves which were hanged railed on him, saying, If you are the Messiah, save yourself and save us. But the other answer rebuked him, saying, Don't you fear the God of Israel, seeing that you are in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, in other words, we're getting what we deserve for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man, Yeshua, he has done nothing amiss. He's done nothing to deserve the punishment that is upon us. And so then he said to Yeshua, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Yeshua said unto him, Verily I say unto you, Today you shall be with me in paradise. When we examine Yeshua, we likewise need to find him without blemish. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 and 19, it says, For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, from your vain conversation received by the tradition of your fathers, what is the tradition of your fathers? 
It is the oral law. And so what it's saying is, you're not redeemed by the tradition of your fathers. You're not redeemed by following the oral law. But this is how you are redeemed. You're redeemed with the precious blood of Yeshua as a lamb without blemish and without spot. The lamb of Yahweh is Yeshua. In Genesis chapter 22, verse 7, it says, And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father, and said, My father. And he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold, the fire and the wood. But where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Who is that lamb that became a burnt offering? It is Yeshua the Messiah. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 1 and verse 7. Who has believed thy report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? The word arm there in Hebrew is Zeroah. Zeroah is the Hebrew term for the shank bone that is on your plate at Passover. Yeshua is the Zeroah, the shank bone, the lamb of the God of Israel. For he was oppressed and was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before his shears is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. Today, traditional Judaism argues that Isaiah chapter 53 is not speaking about Yeshua. It's speaking about the nation of Israel. Now, if you go back and really read the writings of the rabbis, uh, the earlier writings, they will be honest and say Isaiah 53 speaks about the Messiah. But modern Judaism, in order to distance themselves from anything having to do with Yeshua, makes a counter-argument. But they are partially correct in their argument, and how are they partially correct saying that Isaiah 53 speaks about the nation of Israel? Because it's based upon this principle. What happens to the Messiah happens to Israel. And what happens to Israel happens to the Messiah. Why? Because he is one with his people. The nation of Israel has suffered these things, and so the Messiah suffered these things as well, because it tells us in all their affliction, he was afflicted. And so John chapter 1, verse 29 says, The next day John, seeing Yeshua coming unto him, said, Behold, the Lamb of God, Yeshua is the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. The Lamb was of the first year. Exodus chapter 12, verse 5. Your Lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You shall take it from the sheep and the goats. The firstborn of both man and beast is to be set aside and given to the God of Israel. We can see this in Exodus chapter 13, verse 2, and then verses 11 through 13, as it is written. Sanctify unto me all the firstborn, whatsoever opens the womb among the children of Israel, both of man and beast, it's mine. And it shall be when the Lord shall bring you into the land of the Canaanites, as he swear unto you and to your fathers, and shall give it to you, that ye shall set apart unto the Lord all that open the matrix, and every firstling that comes of the beast, which you have, the males shall be the Lord's. And every firstling of a donkey shall you redeem with a lamb. And if you do not redeem it, then you shall break his neck, and all the firstborn of man among the children of Israel shall you redeem. Yeshua was the firstborn of Miriam and Yosef. In Matthew chapter 1, verse 20 and 21, and then verses 24 and 25, it is written, But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, fear not to take unto you Mary your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit. And she shall bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Yeshua, for he will save his people from their sins. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife. And knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Yeshua. Yeshua is the firstborn of many brethren. Romans chapter 8, verse 29, 
And then Colossians chapter 1, verse 15 and 18. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestine to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren, who is the image of the invisible Elohim, the firstborn of every creature. And he is the head of the body, the congregation, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. Going back to Exodus chapter 12, verse 5, the lamb was a male lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. Sin came into the world through a man, that is Adam, and as a result, a male, Yeshua, died to atone for the sin of Adam. Adam represents all of mankind. Romans chapter 5, verse 12 says, Wherefore, as by one man... Sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed unto all men, for that all have sinned. For Adam was first formed, then Eve, it says in First Timothy chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Adam should have stood in the gap and not listened and received which came forth from his wife because he knew exactly what was going on, and he did not stand in the gap. He partook of the sin with her. So Adam was at fault. Yeshua died on the tree to atone for the sin of mankind. Romans chapter 5, verses 17 through 19. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Yeshua HaMashiach. Therefore, as by the offense of one, that is Adam, judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, that is Yeshua the Messiah, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. This lamb was for a house. Exodus chapter 12, verse 3. Speak unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. Notice the lamb was for a house. That's because the God of Israel wants an entire household to be redeemed, saved, or delivered from the bondages of sin. The redeemed family, the Messiah, are members of the household of faith. Galatians chapter 6 verse 10 says, As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 19 says, Now therefore you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints, and of the household of the God of Israel. Salvation and redemption has always been for an entire household. In Genesis chapter 7 verse 1, it says about Noah and his family. And the Lord said to Noah, Come you and all your house into the ark for thee, have I seen righteous before me in this generation? In Genesis chapter 18, verses 17 through 19, it is written, And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do, seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and a mighty nation, and all nations of the earth shall be blessed in him? For I know him that he will command his children and his household after him and that they will keep the way of the Lord. What's keeping the way of the Lord? Following Torah, and do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken of him. Joshua chapter 24 and verse 15 says, And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Acts chapter 16 verse 31 says, 
and they said, believe in Yeshua HaMashiach, and you will be saved and your house. Acts chapter 18, verse 8. And Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his house. And many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were immersed. There is a progressive revelation of the Lamb. The Lamb is not only for a house, but the Lamb is also for a nation, and the Lamb is also for the entire world. In Exodus chapter 12, verse 3, we see that the Lamb is specified for a house. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. John chapter 11 verse 50 tells us that the lamb is for a nation. Nor consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people and that the whole nation perish not. And this spake he not of himself being high priest that year. He prophesied that Yeshua would die for that nation. And then John chapter 1 verse 29 we see the lamb is for the entire world. The next day, John, seeing Yeshua coming unto him, said, Behold, the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. Next, we need to understand from Exodus chapter 12, verse 6, that the Lamb was specified to be killed between the evenings, is what it says in the Hebrew. Exodus chapter 12, verse 6, And ye shall keep it until the fourteenth day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it, and it says in the English, in the evening. But what it says in the Hebrew, and I have the Hebrew here, is it, the Hebrew says, kill it, bain ha eravim, which means kill it between the evenings. Kill it between the evenings. When is between the evenings? Well, in order to understand this, we need to understand the biblical day. A biblical day goes from sundown to sundown. We can see this from creation. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 5, it says regarding the first day of creation, and God called the light day and the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning were the first day. Notice the day is evening and morning. Now the second day, Genesis chapter 1, verse 8. And God called the firmament heaven, and evening and morning were the second day. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 13, and evening and morning were the third day. Notice each day begins in the evening, and it ends in the morning. But looking at the biblical day, it's 24 hours. It goes from sundown to sundown. And so, sundown being basically 6 p.m., from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m., that is the first 12 hours of the 24-hour day, that is the evening part of the day. Then from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m., that is known as the morning part of the day. So a day has an evening and a morning. But the morning itself is subdivided into a morning and an evening. So from 6 a.m. to noon is the morning part of the morning part of the day. From noon to 6 p.m. is the evening part of the morning part of the day. It tells us that Yeshua died on the tree at the ninth hour. That is the ninth hour in the morning part of the day. So that day begins basically at 6 a.m. So if we go nine hours, the ninth hour is 3 o'clock p.m. So 3 o'clock p.m., you can see here, is right in the middle of the evening part of the morning part of the day. 3 p.m. is between the evenings. We're told that Yeshua died between the evenings at the ninth hour of the day. And Matthew chapter 27, verses 45 and 46 and verse 50, it says, Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land unto the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour Yeshua cried with a loud voice, saying, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Quoting from Psalm 22. Matthew 27, verse 50 goes ahead and says, Yeshua, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up his spirit. So Yeshua 
is killed between the evenings. Now, there's a, also a specification regarding the lamb in Exodus chapter 12, verse 6, that the whole assembly shall kill the lamb, and you shall kill it, and you shall keep it up until the 14th day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. The sins of the entire world are responsible for the death of Yeshua on the tree. In John chapter 10, verses 17 and 18, it is written, Therefore does my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I may take it up again. No man takes it from me. No one has the authority to cause me to die. But I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it up again. This commandment have I received of my Father. In Romans chapter 3, verse 23, it says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans chapter 5, verse 8 says, But God commanded his love toward us, and that while we were sinners, Messiah died for us. Sin caused Messiah to die on the tree. Who commits sin? The entire world, Jew and non-Jew. In the, the natural events that, that happened in the crucifixion of Yeshua, it tells us that there were both Jew and non-Jew who conspired to crucify the Messiah. In Acts chapter 4, verses 26 and 27, it says, The kings of the earth stood up, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Messiah. For of a truth against the holy trial Yeshua whom thou hast anointed, Herod, Pontius Pilate, the Gentiles, and the people of Israel were gathered together. Was it the Jews who killed Yeshua? No, it was the sin of the world that killed Yeshua. And no one had the power to cause him to die. He had to voluntarily give up his life as a burnt offering. There were Jews who were part of, of the events, but there were non-Jews as a part of the events as well, but ultimately the reason why he died was because Adam sinned. It was for the sins of the whole world. This is going to conclude this week's teaching on Passover and the spiritual application of Passover. In the next session, we will examine part two of the spiritual application of Passover. So I pray that this teaching has been a blessing to you in helping you to better understand Passover and how Passover relates and pertains to Yeshua the Messiah and our personal relationship with him. Remember that when we study the scriptures, the Bible says in Psalm chapter 40, verse 7, Lo, I come in the volume of the book, it is written of him. So when we study our Hebraic roots, we need to keep all things centered on the Messiah. If you don't keep things centered on the Messiah, you are not truly studying the roots of your faith. And let us also remember what we are instructed in 1 John chapter 2, verse 6. He who says he abides in him, he who says he's a believer in Yeshua the Messiah, ought himself to walk even as he walked. Shalom in Messiah.